I just want to welcome and introduce our guests very quickly. We have uh, Hanna Laura Calio, who's an Estonian writer. She's the author of our story of tongues in shaded streams. Um, she's coming from cultural studies, art theory, and curatorial practice, uh, which she allies with uh, with her devoted interest in depth psychology and environmental humanities as well. And uh, then we also have Fernando Chavez Spinet. On the other hand, uh, who is a Costa Rican journalist and a film curator. Uh, he is the author of our text, A Landscape That Speaks. And uh, last year, he completed an MA in, in film programming and curating at Burbank University of London under a Chevnin scholarship. So it is a great pleasure to have you both here. And yeah, so let's go ahead and, and maybe begin with Hannah's presentation. Hannah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me all right still? Yeah, wonderful. Um, so, so just as an introduction, usually I, I'm quite a spontaneous uh, talker and speaker, but this time as I was sort of gathering my thoughts today in preparation, I ended up uh, kind of writing something which um, I'll be reading. So just in the interest of time as well, uh, just to keep to the 15 minutes, because it's quite a short time. Um, so first of all, I just want to extend uh, words of gratitude to Alessandra and Bimblu uh, for inviting me to submit the text and also to be part of this event today. And also to acknowledge some words but just to extend sort of words of acknowledgement um, to this space that uh, Vimbo is offering. Um, there was this line that kind of struck me in the description of today's event, which was this intention of developing um, the necessary sensitivity to reconnect with our planet and this sort of being a space in which we can do that. So I just feel like I would like to acknowledge that this is a complex work <laughs> that takes many different forms and in which um, each, each has their unique parts and contribution. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, all the small and uh, large scale challenging processes uh, unfolding across the planet at this time and for it to be included in this space as well. So um, in finding my way into this event today, um, I see that we are looking at storytelling uh, as one of the practices and processes of turning towards sensitivity rather than away from it. And in my case, through the, um, through the form of creative nonfiction writing. Uh, the piece published by Wienblo is a lyrical short story uh, which has a personal beginning, an eye to the story that was, at the time of writing, um, alive within. And as the writing process showed, uh, my story is part of a larger story, uh, which I'm both experiencing and contributing to. So my work um, has a twofold nature, um, sides which support each other. The first is the intimate experience I have of the world, experiences which I feel called to, co to constellate uh, in the space of words. The writing thus arises from the desire to give form to to feeling toned observations and intuitive images in the way that the creative use of language is able to, uh, with its limits and possibilities. The other side of the practice is, a, is of a curatorial nature, uh, which for me stretches beyond the particular field, um, such as contemporary art and form, such as exhibition making, though both I've engaged in extensively. Rather, and this is a perception ripening within me over time, I see that the curatorial is a form of attention and a practice of amplification of the many voices other than my own, including those of other humans and non-humans um, and the resonance they cast uh, in between them. Um, so these are the two sides of the coin that I intend to balance with my work. Um, of Tongues and Shaded Streams, which is the title of the text published by Bimblum, arose from the first, um, an inner necessity to write in relationship to a landscape that seemed to inhabit a specific place in my personal history or my personal story. It stood like a symbol within me and I could not quite tell what it was saying. It felt the importance to uh, lean closer. 
So what follows is an introduction to the text uh, for those who have not read it and those who have, including myself, uh, now with the, object, the objective distance these months uh, since its publication gives space for. Um, this lyr lyrical short story sits between poetry and nonfiction. It is written in English and brings forth a rhythmic use of language with a focus on the sound quality of words. Uh, the act of sounding forth or storytelling uh, is one I hold in high regard. Uh, English is not my native tongue, rather one that I've grown intimately into over the years. Um, thus my connection with this vocabulary is fairly embodied, uh, yet will always be one step removed uh, from the depth of a native speaker. Uh, the text is composed in seven short uh, paragraphs and evokes two scenes, the first from early childhood and the second from early adulthood, weaved by the image of a Bach as living both as a physical and an imagined landscape. The first scene shows the child sheltered under the tall and thick canopy of the bog, soaked in the smell of decomposing earth, experiencing both curiosity and caution. The second scene shows her grown up in a busy area of central London, suddenly struck into an inverted experience of the bog, where the physical features of an oxygen poor marshland are now elements of a nuanced inner experience, a sinking feeling, shortness of breath, a dim frame of mind, thoughts languish. I perceive that the central theme of the text um, is a processual negotiation of two disparate lifespans. The first is the source of a bog, a place of premilled nature on the Vimsi Peninsula in the north of Estonia, alongside which I spent the formative years of my childhood. Uh, the second lifespan is that of, a hu of, that of a human, sprouting from seed to child to woman to dust. Um, she experiences herself in relationship to the landscape as a presence faster than herself described in the text as the unblinking eye of the boxsmith, referring to the life force that has spun the bog into being. Later on, I was interested to read that um, scientific studies have found that exposure to scenes of grandeur, whether they are breathtaking natural phenomena or a human-built artifact, can exert a measurable influence on our feelings about ourselves, how we treat others, and even our perception of time. In the text, the nightfall, as the child drifts into sleep, is when these, this uh, 9,000 year old vegetal, vegetal imagination, uh, the bog, is seen to reside within her. Um, Alessandra from Vimlo and I met by way of a peculiar coincidence. When during lockdown, we both participated in an online workshop and were allocated by chance to the same Zoom room from, uh, for group discussion. This was an international event with hundreds of participants, and I bet we were the only two people from Estonia. Later on, we met for a walk, and I shared my experience of returning after many years since I moved away to the Bog in Vimsi, alongside which I had lived as a child. I had discovered that this was an ancient landscape, um, tracked back thousands of years um, to the Anclusius Lake, a predecessor of the Baltic Sea. Uh, what struck my attention in its story of geologic unfolding was that of the post, um, that of post-glacial rebound, a process in which land masses rise after the removal of the weight of ice sheets during the glacial period. Whilst holding this living image in mind, I was moved uh, to consider this as an event of an inner psychological landscape, the emergence of conscious thoughts, perhaps, um, as a form uh, birthed out of the dreaming ocean. Where does the bog come from? Where is it going? These are questions that came to me whilst writing. Uh, tracing this bog back 9,000 years seemed insufficient as an origin story, even as it offered a welcomed way into adopting a perspective that was able to hold much more than a single human life is able to. What it guided me towards, however, was asking whether the same applies to us as humans. Where does she come from? Where is she going? How far into the past and into the future do we trace the stories of our comings and goings? May we inhabit a story in which the geologic unfolding, others with whom we share space, breath, and time, 
and the unfurling of our particular lives resonate like notes in a complex composition? What shift in action would this bring about within the way we inhabit and bring forth the world? Um, language is an ambivalent tool, sometimes quite um, counterproductive for experiencing what our body knows regardless. Yet I feel the process of turning to write um, is first and foremost a practice of turning to listen and perceive or receive. While sitting with um, of tongues in shaded streams and engaging with the image of the bog, uh, which came forth as a feeling of stillness, enigma, stagnation and stuckness, I was surprised by the crisp clarity with which my inner eye was then drawn to the creek, uh, whose burbling flowing quality was present throughout. It is by this creek, uh, by this creek that the text and the line of cut image uh, produced by Ana Ruiz to accompany the text find both its beginning and ending. Uh, the following words came to me. Um, the stream yearns for the ocean, and in seeking, relieves what is stagnant. Nature metaphors are not inclusive by any means, but there is something to vegetal language um, that draws attention. And what does it mean for the stream to have, your, to have a yearning or a practice of seeking? On a personal level, uh, the sentence seems to suggest that in the place from which the challenge arises is also where its remedy resides. This curious seeking, which relieves, uh, sounds akin to the creative process, a motion that has a direction uh, yet disclosed to the seeker. I'd like to bring this to a close with words from the writer, uh, educator, and conservationist uh, Terry Tempest Williams, uh, which resonate. And she says that uh, wilderness is not a place outside of us, though it exists and needs to be protected. Uh, wildness is within us. It is the source of our biggest imagination, uh, the birthplace of our DNA. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was um, that was lovely, and it already opens up the door for many other interrogations that that we could explore later on. But um, but I would like to maybe. Uh, gave the word to Fernando and let's have his presentation and then we can come back and have a little conversation about uh, both, both uh, presentations. So thank you, Hannah and uh, Fernando, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Well, first I would like to thank you for this uh, space. I think it's very important. I mean, I guess, I guess when you write any sort of piece, you always expect to meet your readers and you're always expecting to have this moment where you can connect with the audience, with whomever is listening, is li whoever is listening. Uh, you just want to know that someone out there is, is listening and someone out there um, can share your preoccupations. And it's always very nice when you actually have the space to do it. Uh, so thank you very much. And thank you, Hannah, for sharing the space with me and with us. Um, well, in the piece that I wrote for Wimblue, which is called Un Paisaje Que Habla, uh, or which you kindly translated as A Landscape That Speaks, I wanted to explore three pieces of creative documentary, of what you could call creative documentary anyway, that reflect on the relationships between landscape and history, and the ways that film and photography can reconnect the past to the present, and the past to the present, and the present to the future. I was very interested in, in figuring out how these representations of, of death and mourning, which are present in these landscapes, which I'll explain in a minute, are sort of pathways into different futures and how they can open up new questions and new ways of, of new ways for us to relate to, our, to the landscapes that surround us and new ways for us to think about the passing of time and the passing of history and how we, how our actions are part of this enmeshment of, of temporalities and I was very interested as well in the in the power of of the materiality of, of, of the materiality of photography and film themselves to convey the sort of pain and this sort of um, painful memory that it's inscribed into the landscape 
So I speak about three projects. One of them is 1915 by Diana Marcosian, which is a photography project that basically tries to reconnect survivors from the from the Armenian genocide with the current with their former homeland. And the photographer visits their homeland and brings them back pictures of where they where their villages used to be basically and it's a very beautiful project in which the photographer what, what she does is she makes it possible for these people who are very very mature very old makes it possible for them to reconnect with something that seems completely out of time completely out of reach completely part of the history of another century part of the history of another of another world if you will and but she brings them back photography and she brings them back through images and she makes it possible for them to close a chapter in their lives now that they're 110 115 years old and 105 i'm sorry years old to close this chapter in their lives and to sort of realize how that there are other people who are aware that that landscape used to be their home that that place used to be theirs that that place was witness to their suffering and in a similar way one being the filmmaker does does away with differences between that sort of remembered landscape and the lived landscape in dead souls dead souls is a massive project it's eight hours long and over 600 hours of material were filmed to well, film for it and he basically brings back all the memories through intense interviews with his subjects in which they reconstruct the pain that they suffered when they were sent away to concentration camps in the, in the chinese desert uh, because they were counter-revolutionaries or they were considered counter-revolutionaries and many of them died and this is a crime that hasn't been acknowledged and this is a pain that hasn't been acknowledged and what happens then is that by interviewing them and by letting them speak and by letting them reconstruct what they lived he in my point of view from my point of view he's making it possible for them to live that again in a different way obviously in, and it's making it, it's making it possible for us to inhabit that world for a moment a long moment it's eight hours but for a moment to share something that happened in this world that is considered invisible that is considered not worthy of telling not worthy of remembering and this remembrance becomes it sort of becomes another possible world another possible future another possible present by re-excavating the past and finally i speak about i write about altiplano by malena slam which is a short film about the chilean altiplano in which we see how the landscape encloses both ge geological time and human time and how we can traverse it and explore it from the point of view of deep time and from the point of view of those things that we don't remember and those things that we can't remember and what she does is she shows us the landscape and she uses infrasound uh, to convey the sense of depth and the sense of profound immersion to the landscape that i found that i found really beautiful and really touching and that i of course connected with dead souls in 1915 because the history of the chilean desert is also a history of oppression and it's also a history of pain and even though this is not explicitly mentioned in the film it is something that you have in your mind in the back of your mind whenever you see something that discusses um this sort of landscape and this sort of of places and because you can't when you look at a landscape you can't forget what happened in it when you can't forget what kind of relationships took place on it and what made it possible and what made it possible as a landscape 
which is a human construction, of course. Um, to read a landscape implies an effort to reintegrate it into history. It's an active reading that by transforming it uh, in the present, recovers its past to clinch it to another future, a future where mourning is possible and visible. This visibility of mourning, I find very important and I found very, very moving as well. Because pain, like I write in my piece, is ultimately unspeakable. Uh, by the end of Dead Souls and by the end of Traces, another film by Wang Bing, the only thing we see is scattered bones and scattered re human remains in the desert. Because there's nothing else that can convey the amount of pain and suffering that was lived in that landscape. And although it is unspeakable, we can make it, we can, we can try to approach it through images and we can try to approach it through sound. And I find that, and I find that profoundly moving, very challenging, and an invitation for us as viewers, as, as, as viewers to participate in this reconstruction, in this reconstruction, I'm sorry, to participate in this remaking of the past and to participate in our construction of the, of the present, to make another future possible, a future where human lives that were lost are valued, where human lives that were sacrificed are recognized, are, are acknowledged. And what I ultimately wonder is how film and photography can be a retool for remaking landscape, how they can be transformed through intervention like the ones proposed by the films and, and the photographic project, and also how they explore the materiality of the medium to convey their ideas and memory and pain, both in the, each one in their different way. Some do it through the visual, tactile, and, and auditive quali auditory qualities of video. Others do it through film or photography itself, by literally printing the photography and bringing it to the survivor of the Armenian genocide. And I find that very stimulating. And I find that something that I'm very interested in because it really poses many questions about how what what the limits of the work of art are and what the limits to what we do are. Uh, where does it end? Where does it stop? How can we make other sorts of connections with materiality? And how can we connect that materiality to the landscape itself? And well, that's pretty much what I wanted to say about this piece. I hope you read it and you, and you enjoy it. And I hope you get to watch the films and see the photographic project. Thank you so much, Fernando. That was really interesting as well. Um, I think it takes a little bit of a, of a different take from, uh, from Hannah when we give her speaking about like the, um, sort of like the body of the medium itself, in this case, photography and, and, uh, and film and what they can do. I, um, I, okay, I have, a, I have a couple of questions that, uh, that raised that I was thinking about while, while listening to you. So I'm thinking that I will just uh, present these questions and maybe I will give a space for you to, if you have questions to each other. And then we can open it up for anyone in the audience who might want to participate as well. Um, okay, so, so my first question is for both of you is about, um, mm, okay, we, we've spoken about uh, what, what the landscape does to the writing or to the writer's imagination, or um, in the case of Fernando also, like what the uh, art or the medium is doing to the landscape. So this sort of reciprocity and I'm now wondering um, about the audience, like uh, like how does the body of the audience can come in contact with these pieces? You know, both in, in Hannah's um, uh, writing, like uh, I remember that when I first uh, read it, and then we discussed it that should we have photos for this place, and, and I thought that absolutely not because um, Hannah's works what was, was really very corporeally taking me uh, to the book and taking me to this space, uh, to this landscape and to this sort of psychological state. 
And um, and also, you know, with, with Fernando's analysis of these films and, and the way that you sort of um, navigate through them, I, I started to feel that, um, let's say, so that the trick in these projects, it's precisely the fact that it can connect sensorially to the audience. So I just wanted to hear your take on this. Like, like okay, if we have like this sort of art that has, that it's made, as Hannah says, in relationship with the landscape, and that it's having, which the, the landscape is ha it's having its impact in the creator and vice versa, um, where do the audience come, the audiences come in this equation, you know? Um, yeah, how do they play into this relation and this reciprocity, let's see. Maybe I'm gonna go first, uh, Fernando, if that's okay with you. Um, thank you for that question. And it's something that, you know, has been on my mind uh, as well, a lot. Obviously, you know, being um, a curator, it's something that I, I think about as part of my work, but specifically in relationship to writing and to text and to storytelling, perhaps in general, um, I've, just something that popped into my head actually in this moment is that in the past year I had a few experiences of the practice called the way of counsel which is basically a storytelling uh, practice uh, in which we are kind of taught to listen in a different way to listen with the body with the whole body which is a very different way of listening um, in a way, you know, I feel it's true also for myself that the interactions these days, and especially when we are, you know, meeting through formats such as this one, when we're not even in the same space with each other, it's very difficult to engage in this, in this kind of what is the most natural ways of communication, which is body language. And uh, so I think this is a piece of it, but, but even more so, um, where I've sort of gotten or the things that I've explored in relationship to the effect of how we share an experience and how that might take place in the case of writing um, is um, specifically this one article that I came across uh, a while back now uh, called Writing Empathy by Noir um, Al-Sadir, who is a New York-based poet and psychoanalyst. And uh, she um, speaks about the way well, she speaks about poetry uh, specifically and and kind of asking the question, what is poetry? And she's saying that poetry is anything that we feel moved after. And so the article and what she's kind of speaking towards is this idea that that a text or a story that kind of comes from an embodied experience. So, for example, for me, um, you know, having been in that bog, having that childhood experience, then coming to write it, I also have that experience in my body. So when I'm writing, that that experience is there. And so Nuara Sadir anyway says that that we are able to pick up those uh, those beta elements, the sort of movement of the mind of another person. And this is kind of how empathy works and so on. And that's also in the case of storytelling and text. And this is a really curious uh, piece, I think, because um, it kind of really, you know, almost like shifts the understanding of how we relate to each other in, in general, how we share. Um, so that's just something that comes to mind in this moment, yeah. I guess I think about the very, I mean, when you say that a film is eight hours long, it's not something, it's not banal. It's not something that, that doesn't matter at all. It's part of sitting through eight hours of material, whether you do it eight hours in a row or divided in different parts. It's a punishing experience and it's meant to be. And it's meant to be because it's meant to, to convey the amount of suffering that its subjects are speaking about. And it's meant to convey the impossibility of synthesizing pain and the impossibility of trying to summarize death. And the way that the filmmaker finds to implicate the audience in this 
in this painful remembrance is by quote unquote punishing him, punishing him or her with eight hours of thinking through experiencing feeling exhaustion pain and that's that's sort of what i think about when i when i when when you ask that question um there are other ways of course to implicate the audience and there are other ways in which you can relate to a piece such as this but i find that very explicit and very moving as an idea and as as a strategy for making visible what would otherwise remain uncovered. Yeah, I think this is actually a very important point for um, what Hannah mentioned in the beginning that I, I really thank you for acknowledging that and this, um, this necessity to, to or this attempt to create the necessary sensitivity, you know, to reconnect with our planet. And, and I think this is, um, in a way, uh, what we're aspiring to in Windu is that, um, you know, right now, when we think of uh, ecological problems or the way that it connects with uh, justice, with social justice, or, or how it connects with spirituality, for example. And, uh, and what we find in the, in like mainstream communication is um it's sort of like a like heavy messages you know it's always there's a message there's a um sort of i i call it propaganda <laughs> in a way that uh, they're always trying to convince you of something and, and they're just building a whole argument around something and uh and i've seen like tons of documentaries like this and they don't seem to i mean I don't know, after 20 years of doing documentaries that are sort of exposing the truth that has this expository nature, they, they don't seem to create the, to, or to transform into the necessary action or into the necessary sensitivity to, to act for, you know, for our places, for the places that we love and care for. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, as I speak with you, that, that maybe this is sort of like, um, the role of, uh, of creative documentary and creative nonfiction is that, that, that it's not there sort of like to teach something. It's there like to open up an opportunity to experience uh, uh, something. In this case, you know, to experience a landscape in your own body and in your own imagination. And I think this sort of stays with you a lot longer than, you know, sort of this didactical kind of message, you know, that it's trying to convince you of something, whether this is something that you sort of experience through the medium. So like, as Hannah was mentioning, you know, the, the fact that we could, we can experience empathy just by, uh, by reading or perceiving something. And, uh, or in the case of Fernando mentioning that, yeah, we're like forced to sit through, like physically sit through something. Um, then it, it just engages really like your, cognitive process and your sensorial process in a way that I think stays longer with you. And this takes me to the other question I had that, uh, that has to do with, with time scales, because I think both of your pieces are um, sort of uh, bringing together very different time scales. So in the case of uh, Hannah, is like this deep time, this geological time, and, and something that is very present that when we speak about the Anthropocene and we start thinking in geological eras and what we're like able to do to our landscapes. And, and in the case of Fernando also, you know, this maybe more uh, closer history, but not but deeper also in a way that, that we're going really into the injustices that happen in a certain land and the traces that were left in, the, in this landscape throughout like sort of more political history maybe. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm also interested in asking you about this, you know, like, like what can, um, and it's a question that I've been thinking a lot myself, that, that what can creative documentary do for that? You know, like how can creative nonfiction or creative documentary work to sort of weave together 
histories that seem to belong to different time scales, but that are actually sort of like, if we see it coming together. And one of the things that I am most interested about is how it changes the perception of the agency of the landscape. It's as Hannah was mentioning that sort of, we, we suddenly begin to think that can this bug dream? Can like can it yearn for something? So I'm I'm trying uh, like I guess a question that I'm trying to reach is that um, from your point of view, like how do you think creative nonfiction can work this, you know, to to weave the different time scales um, that involve geological, natural processes that involve historical, political processes, but that also involve affective histories, personal affective histories. You know, I think there's like, a, in, in the pieces that Fernando is analyzing and what Tana is writing, there's this presence, you know, that all these histories sort of come together into one. So my question is, yeah, like, like how do you think nonfiction, creating nonfiction is working this out and what can it do to help us see the landscape in a different way? Well, I think that just by making something visible, uh, creative nonfiction is already a sort of intervention in the landscape. By making something, by making an encounter possible, you are transforming the landscape and you are transforming our relationship to it. So by doing something in the landscape, by, by bringing together different timescales in your writing, in your filmmaking, in your photography, you are already intervening into this landscape and you are already changing the way that people connect to it and changing the way it looks and feels. Um, this doesn't mean that the landscape doesn't have an agency of its own, like you say, like you mentioned, that that there is no other non-human history to tell. But obviously human intervention is what makes a landscape possible, what makes the idea of a landscape exist, obviously. So every intervention in, into it, every change that is brought upon it is bound to create new possibilities and it's bound to create new timescales and it's bound to create new encounters between timescales that I find very interesting and that I think have a lot of potential to inspire, to, to hurt, to open up a space for, for mourning, like I said before. And these are all things that can happen in the space of nonfiction, of creative nonfiction. These are all things that can happen when you bring together different time scales, when you bring together different characters, when you bring together different ways of telling. That's what it makes possible. Yeah, thank you for that, Fernando. Um, yeah, I find it quite interesting what you're saying as well about um, almost as if even the act of, of writing or the act of filmmaking from the perspective of, say, the, the artist, him or herself, is already an inscription in, in the system. And I really feel drawn to that too. And I think it's because that's, that's almost the sensitivity aspect. It's like, that is what it means to be sensitive. Then we're sensitive to these minute changes that happen all the time and that we're always responsible for. And this doesn't exclude artistic practice or poetic work or you know, even text-based work or language work. And I think that's perhaps specifically interesting that language itself, be it visual language or, or um, you know, verbal language, has quite a lot of agency in shaping uh, the reality that we inhabit. And just to add to that, um, what I wrote down for myself um, as, as a kind of response to this is like the word attention. So I feel like, um, first of all, speaking from the point of view of um, 
of you know someone who has written a text uh, that has these where it is that I'm, it was my intention to engage with different time scales and and I feel that the way that that happens is by bringing attention to it. This is almost all that's needed. So in a way, um, I think it also takes, as I was saying in the beginning of, um, of when, I, when I was speaking earlier, this idea of also that I think all of us bring something different to this, to this world and to this process of, you know, what we're all trying to do. Like, but what we're drawn to bring our attention to is what matters. And that's really unique for each one of us. Um, and I feel like for someone like me and for Fernando and the people that Fernando is speaking about, the artists, and many, many other people, uh, we're drawn to bring our attention to these different time scales. That's just what it is. And I think then it's translated into, kind of through the creative process into a work that um, is transmitted into the world and will have its impact. Mm. But yes, and I also, I guess I wanted to highlight um, the fact that perhaps it's even less about doing, it's, it's less about kind of making a work do something. Um, but I feel that it's almost a simple act of a wish to bring attention to something. So to not discount the personal uh, yearning to do so, and that already having quite an impact. So kind of starting from oneself um, and something I'm dwelling on. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I'm by your words reminded uh, by anthropologist Anna Singh, who, who has this um, arts of noticing. That, uh, she says that this is what we're, we're trying to do in the Anthropocene, is uh, just notice everything that had been around us that, uh, that we for so long just overlooked. And now we're realizing that there's like world making abilities in, in everything around us, you know. And for me, these different time scales really underline this, you know, that, that I'm, I'm able to imagine a bug dreaming because I see it in this huge time scale. And there you can see the movement, there you can see, you know, like the changes, there you can see sort of some sort of aspiration in a way. Um, the same for if, like, if we go to political history, it's like it's, if I see it into this uh, historic time, then, then I can see the traces. I can see what's been left behind in this landscape and in our bodies. But it takes like this vision, you know, like it's sort of like, it feels kind of like expanding time so that we can really see all these subtle movements that happen in slow motion in a way. And that we're like in our anthropo centric time scale we just sort of disregard all the time i would like to to ask hannah about when you stumble upon the bog by tottenham court road you are remaking the bog and you are creating another layer of history and another layer of memory and another layer of sensitivity in a place and this is something that I think, which, which probably happens every day, which probably happens every day that someone is walking by Tottenham Court Road Station or wherever, and they imagine or they remember or they think about something connected to their inner lives. But that's where the practice of, of writing comes in, to untangle that sort of entanglement, to untangle that that sort of connection between past and present and future and different temporalities and different timescales and different places. And I think what writing makes possible is for this moment of connection and this moment of meeting each other which I find very powerful and I found very moving. And so I guess I would like to ask you how, how does it feel to make this possible? How does it feel to, to open up these connections and to create these bonds 
between distant places and distant times? Wow, what a beautiful question. Thank you. <laughs> really beautiful. How does it feel? I also really like your reflection uh, about, which is sort of, you know, I see you bridging um, this idea that you bring forth about how we make new history or in a way making new history, making new feature through this kind of active memory. And, uh, and I agree with you. I think it's a process that happens all the time. Um, that we are in fact always kind of, as you say, entangled with these various images um, of kind of memory of projection forward into the future and so on. And like you say, the moment of, of writing is a way to sort of uh, give that form in a different way and to kind of, at least the way that I experience it is, is kind of a way to bring it well out of the mind. It's out of the stream of experience into form that is shareable. Uh, it's interesting now that I'm reflecting about what you're saying about this act of making a new future because this is a new way for uh, looking at it for me um, because I think the way that I experienced it and I have to say that this this all came about in the process of writing so when I really started writing I didn't expect to find that book or that sort of it was an experience I had but the link between that landscape being a placeholder for that feeling really came through the process of writing and uh, and that's when I sort of this question came to mind about you know the landscapes that we inhabit throughout our lives perhaps specifically as children how might they live on within us as the symbolic as the symbolic vocabulary for the expression of something that we might experience later on and uh well it's a question i don't have an answer for but you're asking specifically about the experience or the feeling of, of doing that and it's it feels like um travel in a way it feels like a journey and it feels like um a kind of an expansion of identity uh, which is uh, perhaps the most interesting part of me because then through the process of writing something that is both personal and impersonal, uh, I'm able to locate myself in these different histories that are both me and something beyond me. Um, and that's really a, an interesting feeling. I don't know if I'm able to put words to it exactly what it is, but, but yeah, these are the thoughts that come to mind. I think um, I'm, I'm like trying to link this also to film and to photography because, as you said, it's the same. That it's sort of a language, and uh, if we if we sort of look at at the work of um, uh, filmmakers who move within, or like photographers who move within this language of creative documentary, this is something that it's very present. What you mentioned, it's sort of like a very personal symbolism. So there are things that no matter like what the story that they're addressing or like the topic that they're addressing, there are sort of like these recurrent symbols that they're bringing back or these recurrent forms. Sometimes it's not the content, but the form in which they're like uh, approaching a story or a topic or a landscape. It's, um, and, and I think this is, um, it's interesting in the way that you put it in a way that our our body becomes sort of like a landscape itself, like full of these sort of traces from, uh, I was actually in a class the other day where a professor called it our cognitive stuck. <laughs> it's like we all come with this cognitive stuck, with this cognitive baggage, let's say. And um, uh, I think this is really interesting because then it's, it's also like, as you say, that the landscape becomes like a placeholder for, for your imagination and your body and your experience. But I think it also happens the other way around. That uh, in a way, when we are like uh, filmmakers and writers and dealing with landscape, 
we also sort of become like this placeholder for these places, imagination, these places, bodies and traces. And there's this sort of reciprocity. And what I feel really like to me, what's fascinating, it's the fact that whatever comes out, like the writing, the film, the photographs, it's coming from this, from, from this space of relationality. No, it's not either in me or in the landscape, but in this meeting of sorts, let's say. And, and I think this is in a way something that, that has to do with, with how, do we, how do we tell stories with the landscape rather than about the landscape. And how, how do we find the, the form to acknowledge this landscape and the fact that it, the landscape also has a story to tell and that I can sort of be a channel for that. But I also have my story to tell and the landscape can be like the channel to that. And then as um, we were also talking about this the other day in the context of wind blue and what we're trying to do, we were like, uh, replying to an interview and it's in ecology, it's this, uh, it's, called, it's called emergent properties. And it's, it's something that emerges from the coexistence of encounter of two things that wouldn't otherwise exist on itself. So I see it very much like this, that, that, that sort of like uh, these stories are sort of emerging out of this coexistence of histories, of, uh, of affection, of traces, of memory. And, um, and yeah, that, that, that maybe we, there is a, a possible possibility for this reciprocity with the landscape through our stories, through our art, let's see. Um, it says it is interesting to observe how the landscape has its double path. Many times it is one that reactivates memory and sometimes it is an experience that frees us from what we see every day. So how do the authors leave their daily landscape? That's a uh, good question. <laughs> I'll leave the authors to it. <laughs> okay, I can go first. Um, yeah, it's a really lovely question. I love it. Um, hmm. It's interesting, this double path as well that uh, uh, Adrienne is mentioning here um, as something that kind of reactivates memory and something that releases us from it. And that's also just something that I want to kind of say or speak to that um, I find that there is also this interesting uh, balance that I came upon in the writing of the text or in general and thinking about this topic that on the one hand we uh, specific, perhaps specifically as kind of creative practitioners of any kind, you know, when we are writing in relationship or even with landscape, we're still engaging with the creative imagination, which is very much a kind of, a, you know, it's coming from a personal space and there's a process of projection that happens. But then at the same time, the landscape is a real entity. It's a real physical thing that has a life of its own that we are a part of but that's definitely not this, just this material to kind of use. Uh, but this question about uh, living the daily landscape is, is really wonderful. And I feel like my answer is gonna come from, from living two very different landscapes in the past 10 years. And, and the sort of difference of that is kind of what, what comes to mind. So, you know, being from Estonia, uh, and also where I'm situated in this moment, which is a very different uh, place to London, which is where I lived and which is what the text also addresses. And, and I guess I felt that living this very urban existence in, in kind of in as, as a difference to living an existence here, which is much more uh, present with kind of the living presence of nature. Um, I'm, I'm seeing that I'm, Mm, being in more communication actually with just with the with the environment kind of uh, living in it in terms of you know obviously my my day-to-day -day doesn't include actually working with the earth um, so I don't have that kind of intimacy with it I don't grow my own food or or things like that but there is a sense of of kind of sensorial inhabitation that's different from from the decade that I spent in London. And it's just a minute difference that I'm 
yeah, that I'm noticing in this moment. But I love the question. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I guess I can only answer that from the point of view of being in lockdown. And that means that we've been deprived of our daily landscapes, of our usual daily landscapes for a long time now. And that has sort of led me to think more think more intensely and more about what landscapes do mean and say by themselves and during the during the pandemic i have had the opportunity to go to two very different landscapes uh by the pacific ocean and and the forest and how they suggest new histories and how they carry on without us is very beautiful and it's very moving as well and i guess when we emerge from lockdown eventually we will have felt very differently about landscapes that we left behind so to speak and we and i personally will feel very much more connected to it to them much more connected to to stories that attempt to make visible these linkages that we've been discussing. It's also, again, I think that has to do with time or the rhythm that we're forced into right now, that we were sort of like forced into a stillness or into a slowdown, let's say. And suddenly there are things that we start to notice that our attention can include because we're not running anymore from one place to another. So I think this is also has to do with that. We have one more question from uh, Paolo. Paolo, maybe you want to jump in and, and do it yourself. Yes, hello. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my question uh, is to Hannah. Um, I'm just wondering, while, while you were speaking and uh, after reading um, the, the text, what what are the risks that you have encountered when adding human characteristics to non-human beings as as the bug, for example? Is there any like uh, ethical risk that you have found in the way of on the process of creation? I'm wondering because um, I just think that sometimes we put human uh, behavior and characteristics to to non-human beings and that actually can cause like uh, restrict the possibilities and i'm just wondering if you have found any any risk on throughout your work on that sense thank you thank you for that uh, uh yes absolutely uh it's something that um, that i'm sort of very conscious of i think uh, writing as as i mentioned as well in the in the presentation kind of about this use of um even natural or nature metaphors i find is quite um it can be sort of reductive often and when i think about my own uh writing and the writing that i've done you know from the since childhood it's sort of kind of remained the same and it's always has to do with this with some kind of uh relationship or it's kind some kind of um a natural entity an entity of nature kind of being present there and it's always through this anthropomorphizing the way that it comes to me um it's almost like some kind of quality of creativity or imagination that sort of wants that animistic aspect and at the same time um i'm aware of the risk of doing that too because obviously that's then reductive um, and can contribute further to this to the to the sort of narrative of the anthropocene and it's something that i was writing my master's thesis on actually when i was in goldsmiths uh graduated in 2015 and i was sort of uh, studying this just how the anthropocene is sort of like articulated in the humanities and and 
I saw that there was this um, tendency to to kind of put that term forth as this new way of looking at the earth now, you know, as they say that uh, there is nothing that hasn't been touched by human hands, thus all of nature and all of the, what we can see is sort of man-made. And I sort of wanted to disrupt that somehow and to see, you know, what could it be um, a benefit for? So if, if we're not engaging in this sort of constant anthropomorphizing, but perhaps it gives us an opportunity to sort of just sort of scale out and look at earth magnitude and perhaps still, um, well, just to, to do that as a method and see what happens. Um, Yes, I'm sort of also feeling quite kind of vulnerable in relation to that question because um, it's a real one and it's something that I, I try to negotiate for myself. And this is sort of also what I was saying before, this sort of how to balance these two things, how to balance the fact that, you know, there is um, me and my creative endeavor, the way that my imagination works and the way that I'm drawn to things and the way that I'm, you know, then listening and, and picking up and, and putting that into writing. And like Terry Tempest Williams said, you know, wilderness or wild places of the world or the natural world is a physical reality in itself. Um, so I'm not sure if I have a, a straightforward question to that. Um, or to say that it's something that I think about a lot. Thank you. Um, yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for the answer. I, I, I'm just thinking that while you were answering that um, one way to see it and one way to like solve the uh, balance problem is to kind of talk from 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 the honesty, you know, from what sincere, being sincere about about what you want to say and say it on your own way. That's a way to actually kind of balance that. I think so. Because, um, yeah, we always going to be, as you mentioned before, the language is the first uh, agent that will restrict our reality at some point. So I think it's a good way to see it, uh, being sincere what you're going to say and say it from, sounds a little bit corny though, but I think it's, it's a way to see it. <laughs> but I think Thank in you. a way, in, in a way, this is also one of the, like the beauties of uh, creative non-fiction or creative documentary is in, in a way that it's a practice that it doesn't um it doesn't ask for the truth like you know like an objective truth it's not uh in this sense it's not like the language of, of news or, or like a, a reportage where, where you're like presenting facts but um this is something that i really like about this language and it's this license you know there's there's a poetic li license in creative documentary there's an imaginative li li license so it's not um of course there is an ethical question there always is when there's a representation but uh, but at the same time when when you uh, embrace this language one of the beauties is that uh, precisely that you sort of open up to this license to possibilities that what if this landscape could do this or what if this uh, non-human could like act like us and the other way around like what if i could like uh, do this like glacial rebound you know like how would that look for me and so i think this is also sort of the, the nice thing of this language we have one more question sophie she says when we're speaking about films and photography we understand these arts need two primary materials time and light I think it's curious how time leaves uh, and stop existing, but landscapes, spaces are there. Capturing in an image, telling many things to link in the end with the memory of the author or society, where we can say that after the artist manipulated time and light creates a memory. So I am interested in the opinion of the authors related to memory and feelings of past times, past stories that a landscape can cause as a trigger. This is what's most beautiful about this sort of artistic practice. The fact that a landscape can be brought to life through the telling of these stories and through the telling of new stories as well. Um, in many ways, when we approach landscape 
what we're trying to do, we're trying to figure it out. We're trying to find out what's behind it, what's beneath it. But if we, but if we approach it from a point of view of genuine curiosity and the sincerity that Pablo was speaking about, we can actually let it, let the landscape speak, and we can actually let the past suggest itself into our future, into our present. I'm sorry. Um, and landscape, the, the sort of remembrance that is made possible through this approach makes it possible for us to understand that we are not alone, that we are not alone in the world, that we are not alone without landscapes, that we are not alone without non-human beings, that we are part of a system, that we are part of an entanglement of experiences that we are able to bring to, to, bring to light, to bring forth through the making and remaking of like you stated very beautifully in your question very beautifully in your question remaking of light and time through, through image making if you want to support our project you can share this episode visit our digital magazine winblue.com subscribe to our newsletter or join our patreon community where you can access exclusive content starting at three us dollars a month Your support allows us to create and share content that reimagines a fair and healthy world for all life forms.